like to encourage you before we begin today, kind of piggybacking off of what Pastor Dave already said, but just uh, encourage you to, to be in prayer uh, for, for our country, obviously after the events of yesterday. And, and I say that as pray, you can pray for Trump, pray for Biden. I'm encouraging you to pray for all our leadership uh, in this country. Um, I think when you look at the political world, the political rhetoric, it's so heightened right now. Uh, it, it's really out of control, and I think we as a church, I, I, I would pray that we do our part in speaking well in how we speak when it comes to that political culture. So be in prayer uh, for our country, for our leadership. We want leaders that are leader, men and women of character and integrity that will lead this country well and, and value uh, people. So my encouragement to you is just to, to really commit yourself to prayer and, and watch over your words and how you speak about things that, that, that take place and, and candidates and, and, and things like that. So that's my um, uh, kind of plead as we enter into today. So uh, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. We're going to be looking at, at chapter 10, all of it, uh, this morning as we continue in, in this series. And uh, as we jump into this, uh, some of you obviously... Uh, Hollywood is a big part of our culture. We all watch movies, we watch TV, we watch music, entertainment, all those things. But have you ever noticed that, that Hollywood loves to congratulate itself? Like, like it really loves to praise itself. If you look it up, Hollywood has over 30 different award shows by Hollywood for Hollywood. You have the Oscars, you have the Emmys, you have the Grammys, you have the, the Guilds. I don't even know what some of these are. You have the SDSA, the Dorian, the Global Globes, the SAGs, Tony, and more. You could go on and on and, and list them. They, they love to boast, and they're just obsessed with, with self-praise. In, in a lot of ways, they believe they are the elite of society who should have an expert voice in everything. You've heard this. An expert voice in everything due to their fames, even politics and even family and all those things. I'm not saying everyone in Hollywood is a horrible person, but I think if we just look at it, I think we know it's probably not the most purest and humble in this industry that there is. And the critics, this is where we're going. The critics that we've been talking about, demeaning Paul. Paul, who was the founder of the Corinthian church. He was the founder. He was their, their pastor, right? These critics have come in and they're demeaning Paul. And, and they're not much different than what we would say are the Hollywood elite. They're full of pride. They're obsessed with, with themselves. They're obsessed with self-praise. And they use their status to woo people to their false gospel and, and really lies uh, that they claim. And what Paul's doing here, his tone is changing in chapter 10. And Paul sounds a call to arms using unconventional warfare for the sake of gospel purity. His ultimate desire really is to uphold the truth that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. And, and Paul is defending that and upholding that against these critics that have made their way into the church that he founded. So uh, chapter 10, let's start reading verses 1 to 2 as we walk through this chapter today. Uh, it just says this. It says, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So let's just talk about these first two verses. So, so we know, we've talked about this a lot. The, these self-proclaimed super apostles, they, they were saying that, that Paul's endless afflictions, all his troubles, all his suffering, all his afflictions, they're all just evidence of, of his fleshly, false, worldly ministry. And, and, and they're kind of saying, hey, our, our rhetoric, our superior knowledge, our visions, how we can offer you these mountaintop experiences, are, they're all just proof that our ministry is of God. 
And that Paul's humility, Paul's gentleness, Paul's meekness, Paul's weaknesses, they're saying they're all major flaws that point to the falsehood of his ministry. And it's kind of interesting they point it out because Jesus himself, not only he describes himself as gentle and meek, if you would read Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. He says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls in me. They were accusing Paul of basically being a hypocrite. They're saying, Paul, you know what? You're a beast. It's like saying you're a beast behind the keyboard. You're a beast behind the screen. You're a beast when you write your letters. But you're pretty tame when you're in person. And I think we know people like that, right? Like we know, especially in our social media world, people can be beast behind the screen. It's safe behind the screen. People don't know you. You can be bold. You can be blunt. You can say whatever you want. When people are in person, they probably don't speak that way. I, I, I remember um, back in my immature days, because I'm very mature now, uh, back in my immature days, like, I, I had an apartment with a friend. And, and I remember, this is back in the days before social media. And, and there was like, I guess you call it this, there was like this intercom system at, at this apartment. And, and so this was really fun, right? We, we realized you could talk to people that were outside of the apartment from, your, your, uh, from your, where you were living. And, and they didn't know what apartment it was coming from. So, so we decided to have a lot of fun. Why don't we would turn all the lights out? This is just stupid, immature stuff. And, and we would kind of, one person would stand at the window and kind of peek out. And we would describe the people that were hanging out out front of the apartment. And then the person would go on the monitor and start saying uh, pretty nice comments about them and, and things like that. And they would get all wound up. And they would get all worked up. And we would just sit there laughing and rolling on the floor. Probably if I saw them in person, I would do none of that. We, we, we would do none of that. But it was like you were safe behind the intercom. Now we're safe behind social media. These critics, they disregarded meekness and gentleness. They disregarded it as something the scripture tells us to pursue, a biblical quality that we are to pursue. The thing is this. We don't battle falsehood with sarcastic memes or or belittling those we disagree with. Scripture tells us we are to be meek and gentle. Matthew 5.5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, it is not a personality trait. It is a character trait. It is the gentle, humble approach of one who knows and recognizes his spiritual poverty. It's not the absence of assertiveness. It's the absence of self-assertiveness. You can still be authoritative. You can still be powerful. You can still have a strong voice and be gentle and meek. Every Christian. Every Christian, no matter their natural disposition, is to be meek and gentle. And Paul will show us, and he's been showing us, he is bold whether he is in person or by letter as needed, although he may not have that kind of Hollywood star quality or even looked apart. And Paul has shown, if necessary... He will sound a call to arms using unconventional warfare for the sake of gospel purity. Look at what it says in verses 3 to 6. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience, or when your obedience, sorry, punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So Paul's saying this, like, hear what he's saying. He's saying, we're going to use, we're using supernatural weapons that are strong enough to destroy every stronghold. Paul is fully confident that his arsenal of weapons, 
His arsenal will overcome all opposing forces. This is putting on Ephesians chapter 6. It's putting on everything we spoke about that whole week of VBS, if you were a part of it. What we taught the kids, what we learned as adults, what we celebrated on, on VBS Sunday. It's putting on Ephesians 6, which says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness as, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through, through 18. This is, we prayerfully, we, we prayerfully speak gospel truth in the power of the Spirit. He's saying these weapons destroy arguments. They destroy lofty opinions. They destroy any strongholds that come against the knowledge of God. We are not talking about physical war here. We're not talking about physical weapons. We're not even talking about winning arguments or debates by loudly engaging in a war of words. This is with meekness use divine weapons to destroy sinful patterns, deceptions of Satan's that come against the knowledge of God. You today might be sitting here and you might have some kind of stronghold that has a hold of you. You, you may not even recognize it. You might have something that has a grip on you, on your life, that you know about maybe. That, that you know is just controlling your thoughts, controlling your actions, controlling your way of life outside of God. It could be so many different things. It's like the deceptions of Satan. It could be ignorance where you just don't know and you've never really took the time to try to understand the gospel or really this whole church thing. It could be the stronghold of irrelevance where you just sitting here today and you're hearing this and you're thinking, how could this whatever 2,000 year plus message have any relevance to today? How could this fairy tale apply to me today? How could it have any impact on me? It could be the stronghold of irrelevance. It could be a practical stronghold, like an addiction, something like pornography, drugs, greed, alcohol, power, popularity. Really, if you want in a general sense, you can define a stronghold as anything, anything that hinders spiritual growth. Anything that you exalt above God is a stronghold in your life. And he's saying we have to utilize these divine weapons and we need to pray. We need to pray that the barriers to the knowledge of him will be torn down. That they will be torn down. That our eyes would be open. That our hearts would be moved. So all would know that salvation is the Lord's alone. We are to pray to that end. It's praying as they do in Acts 26, 18. God, open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, turn from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Or in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, we read it earlier in this series. It says, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. It's praying that our eyes would be opened and our hearts would be moved, that veils would be torn down so we could see and believe what Romans 10 verse 9 says. That says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or what 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where it tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is praying to that end, that barriers would be broken and torn out any barrier to the knowledge of God. That means you and I are to take every thought captive, every desire Every motive, every decision, we are giving it to Jesus. We fight strongholds and false prophets together as a body. It's why community is so important. We're not alone in this battle. We're not off on an island somewhere. Don't put yourself on an island. I think so many times Christians, they, they live on an island and if they're struggling or there's stuff going on, it's like they're too ashamed to go to anyone and talk about it. No, we're supposed to be a community where you're supposed to speak into one, another lives, one another's lives. That, that's going to help us in moving and growing. We're supposed to battle this together. We are to speak. We talk church discipline. Speak truth to those who are falling away. We are to call one another to repentance in loving ways. Always with the goal of restoration. We, we want to, to have that desire to see every person obey and submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. See, Paul goes on. He's kind of like in verses 7 to 12. He's kind of like, listen, you, you still doubting? You're still doubting me? Look at verses 7 to 12. He says, look at what is before your eyes. It's almost like just open your eyes and, and look around, right? Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is in Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up, and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that we say by letter, that what we say by letter, when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare classify or compare ourselves, with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. He's saying, you still doubting, church? Like, like seriously, just, just look at what, what's around you. He's really just saying, look, like, do some fact-checking. Just kind of look. Our actions and our words match. Just take a moment to think about it. Think about what you've seen. Think about what you've heard. He, he's saying we are bold in our letters. Absolutely I was bold in my, my letter. But we are also bold in person just without the manipulation and, and the Hollywood show. Like, like some historians say this about Paul. So some say that claim about his appearance, that here was a man who was short. He, it's basically just saying he wasn't a good-looking guy. Like, he, he, he was pretty short. Apparently there was something wrong. Not that being short is a bad thing, but he was short. But it's something like, <laughs> Ron's like, amen. That's right. Good-looking guy right there. So, uh, so anyway, but he was short. There was something wrong with his legs, right? That could have been the thing that hindered him his whole life. They, they claim, right, this is, we, we don't necessarily know this for sure, that his eyebrows met. It's kind of going for like the Anthony Davis look. He kind of had the, the long nose, kind of like Adam Driver, sticking with Hollywood here. Uh, it basically, apparently, for the older ones in this room, he was no Brad Pitt. For the younger ones, maybe he was no Glenn Powell. Some people like him. I don't know. But anyway, those are people that think they're like Hollywood hunks. He wasn't one of them, all right? He, they critiqued his message. They pretty much looked at Paul and said, one, look at him. I mean, there's nothing authoritative about him on that stage. Not that he was on a stage. 
But they're like, he, he doesn't look that great. He's pretty weak. He's got this funny face. And, and his presentation, his, his messages are pretty forgettable. I mean, there is a record in the Bible where someone fell asleep and fell through the roof because of Paul's long preaching and boring preaching. So it, it, here, here's the thing, though. And I don't think it's just with sermons or, or, or preaching. And I'm not using this as an excuse. But, like, if you give a presentation on a regular basis, if you're a person that, that you present on a regular basis or, or you preach a sermon, anything like that, there's just a reality that there's going to be hits and misses, right? Like, if you're doing it all the time, there, there's going to be hits and misses. I, I've always been encouraged uh, by Kevin DeYoung, who I think is a really good pastor, and I would recommend you following him. Look up his website, all that stuff. Just, just look up Kevin DeYoung, right? L listen to him. He, he's really wise. He actually has really good political stuff as well. So, so look up Kevin DeYoung. Uh, but anyway, he always said this. I remember going to a conference one time, and his words were this. Someone who I look at and say, hey, he's a really good preacher, right? He's kind of in the conference circuit, all that stuff. And he said, you know what? Here's reality. When you present on a regular basis, there's some Sundays... Again, it's not an excuse. Some Sundays you hit a single. Other Sundays you're going to get a double. There's some Sundays you're hitting a triple. Every now and then you get a home run. There's rare cases where you might get a grand slam. And then there's the Sundays you just kind of walk up on stage and pray you get hit by a pitch. And it's kind of what he said. And I was like, that's actually really encouraging hearing that from him. That's just reality. Like, like, and they're here, and they're like, oh, his presentations, they're, they're forgettable. He's putting people to sleep, all this stuff. And Paul's saying, look at them. All they do is boast and praise themselves. They're like some a Hollywood, elite Hollywood club organizing their own award shows. They think they're all that, but when you really listen to them, when you really watch them, they prove they lack understanding and truth. Look at their lives. Look at mine. Their boast is self. They're all about self-praise. Their message is a Jesus plus something else. He's saying my boast and my message is Jesus Christ alone. Why? Because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. It's the pure gospel, nothing else. Paul's saying that's what we will uphold. There is nothing I will boast in except the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verses 13 to 18. And he finishes out this section by saying this. He says, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us. To reach even to you, for we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We did not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may greatly enlarged, be, be enlarged. So that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Do you catch there what like, Paul's ultimate hope is in prayer for this church? His ultimate hope in prayer is that this whole church, a lot of them have already repented. A lot of them have already been restored. But there's still those within this church, this young community, that they're still doubting and questioning Paul. And his ultimate prayer and hope is that every single one, the entire church, would embrace and defend the true gospel message of Jesus Christ. He desires them to grow in their faith. He wants them to see them grow, to see their affection set on Christ. And then as they grow in faith, then with him, maybe even being their sending church, with him spreading the message of the gospel from the church into the community and then into the world. That's really our simple hope here. That, that is our, our mission statement. 
Our mission statement says, we desire to bring the gospel to life in the church, community, and world. It all starts being healthy within. It all starts with what takes place within these walls, growing in faith, growing in knowledge, setting our affections on Jesus, submitting our entire being to him as a local church. We must focus on the gospel task that God has given us right here in this place. We are to do that well. We are to focus on that right here where God has placed us. Do that well, and we do that with an eye on the Great Commission. So as we do local well, as we establish ministry here, then we expand into the world. We want the gospel to go beyond us. We want to be that sending place for people to go. We want to be a part of that. We want to do ministry locally and globally. It's our desire. It's why we've committed to getting our missions to 20%. 20% of our giving will go to missions by 2026. That's been our prayer. That's been our goal. That's why we're moving that way. Because we desire to see local and global ministry expand. We desire, most importantly, to do ministry that God commends. We desire to boast in nothing but Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. We, We have no desire to be some social club, some Hollywood club, elitist club. Patting ourselves on the back, feeling good because we have a a nice building with, with comfy chairs and things like that. Like that's all good and great, but we have no desire to just pat ourselves on the back. Our, our, our desire is boldly to boldly proclaim and defend and live the gospel. And to take up the call to arms as needed using unconventional warfare for the sake of gospel purity. Church, this is my challenge when we wrap up today and prepare for communion. My, my challenge is really what we started. Pray for the country. Pray, pray, pray that strongholds would be broken. Strongholds in your life, strongholds against this church community. Pray that strongholds would be broken. Pray that all barriers to the knowledge of God would be torn down. Pray that our gospel ministry will expand from the inside out. And pray we will influence others for the gospel through our meek and gentle character that desires to never boast in self, but boast only in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. Make that your prayer for this church. Don't just just say it, but actually do it and make it your prayer. Let's close uh, this time in a word of prayer. Uh, One of our elders, Mike Scare, is going to come up in a few moments and lead us through communion. As always, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to participate with us in communion. If you do not, just simply let the elements uh, pass you by. So I'm going to pray, and then uh, those leading and handing out communion will come forward. So let's pray together. Uh, Father God, we do pray, Lord, that, that we would be a church, that we would be on our knees in prayer. God, praying that that all strongholds would be broken in our personal lives and the lives of this church. And God, that we would be a place that our boast alone is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, that when people walk through this door, what they hear and what they see, God, would would be a proclamation of Jesus, his sacrifice, what he has done. And and an encouragement and a challenge to, to, to live for him, Lord. God, I pray that we would display that, not just in these walls, but outside these walls as well. As we live out our lives in the community, in our workplaces, where we spend most of our time, uh, in our families. God, I pray that eyes would be open and hearts would be moved and that every desire would be submitted to you, God, so that we can ultimately proclaim you in mighty ways for your glory and your namesake. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.